right, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rebecca Willett. Rebecca Willett is an Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Harvey D. Spangler Faculty Scholar, and Fellow of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She completed her PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rice University in 2005, and was an assistant, then tenured Associate Pref Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University from 2005 to 2013. Willett received the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2007, is a member of the DARPA Computer Science Study Group, and received an Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Program Award in 2010. Willett has also held visiting research has also held visiting researcher or faculty positions at the University of Nice in 2015, the Institute for Peer and Applied Mathematics at UCLA in 2004. The University of Wisconsin Madison 2003 to 2005, the French National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Control in 2003, and the Applied Science Research and Development Laboratory at GE Healthcare in 2002. Dr. Rebecca Willett's talk is called is titled Data Science and Agriculture: Challenges and Opportunities. Please welcome her. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm enjoying the symposium a lot, and uh, I'm very honored to be a part of it. Uh, as Tracy said, I'd like to talk about what I see as some of the key challenges and opportunities that we face as we start thinking about how to use data science in a much more pervasive way across agriculture. And to start, I'd like to describe one small project that I did with my collaborator, Brian Luck, in biological systems engineering here at UW-Madison. And Brian explained to me that when producers are, developing, are, are harvesting corn for cattle silage, so for cattle feed, they'll use this foraging harvester that I have a video of up at the top, which will slice off pieces of the corn stalk and then send those slices through some rotating drums that will grind the kernels into small pieces. And these kernels need to be ground finely enough so that cattle can absorb the starch from the kernels and basically maximize the nutritional content that they're getting from the corn. And so here on the bottom, it's hard to see any difference between these three different piles, but only this one on the right is ground finely enough to be considered um, adequately processed for high quality cattle feed. So when farmers are doing harvest, they take this foresting harvester and they can turn different knobs and choose different settings to determine how finely ground these kernels of corn are. And then they'll take a sample and they'll ship it off to a lab and the people in the lab will send it through a series of sieves to determine the distribution of kernel sizes in this kernel processing score. And they'll return that score to the producer, and then the producer will know whether or not they ground their corn finely enough. Unfortunately, they're not finding this out until maybe a couple of weeks after the harvest is completed. Far too late for them to actually do anything to adjust their harvesting to save costs or to improve quality. And so what Brian and I did together is we developed with some students a smartphone app that would allow uh, producers to take a picture of these corn kernels as they're coming out of the um, foraging harvester and get an automatic assessment of the distribution of kernel sizes and how it's related to sort of the official kernel processing score. And this allows producers to get real-time information about how their harvesting is going and adapt to different conditions like different elevations or diff different fields during their harvest. So this was a big win. Far, producers from across Wisconsin and even as far away as, as France and the Netherlands are really interested in integrating this within their, their harvest. However, it's also a small project. And I think the question that we really want to address today is how can we um, translate these small projects into much more pervasive kinds of uses of data science throughout agriculture? Um, what do we need to do to have more wins like this on a regular basis that are really improving um, the quality of, of production agriculture? And as we've heard multiple times today, the, the dreams are pretty big. I mean, all the way from using drones to persistently uh, survey crops and figure out when there might be some sort of disease or dryness, 
all the way to self-driving tractors, we have a lot of ideas of how we could try to leverage big data in the context of different agricultural applications. That said, there are a lot of key problems that are unsolved. This is more than simply taking black box algorithms and plugging them in to agricultural data sets. And so what I'd like to explore with you today are some of the key obstacles and challenges that we face and where there are some big opportunities at the intersection of data science and, and agriculture. So let me start with this cartoon from XKCD comic strip from 2014. And in this comic, uh, the user is talking to a computer scientist and he says, I want a smartphone app. And with this app, if a user takes a picture, I want to know what their geolocation is when they take the picture. And the computer scientist says, sure, no problem. That would be a very easy task. And then the user says, I also want to know if they took a photo of a bird or not. And the computer scientist says, I'll need a research team in five years. So here we are three years later, and we're moderately successful at this task. But nevertheless, it is a hard problem, and I would argue far from solved. And in general, what's easy for a human, something like identifying whether you have a photo of a bird or not, is much, um, is, can be very difficult for a computer, and vice versa. What's easy for a computer, such as identifying a geolocation, can be extremely difficult uh, for a human. And so what I'd like to do is to talk about why this kind of task is so hard and how it relates to more fundamental challenges across data science and their applications to, to agriculture. So first, let's just talk about what happens when we do machine learning. And in many ways, it's analogous to how a small child learns. So if we wanted to teach a kid how to differentiate between crop-eating robins and pollinating orioles, then a parent might point out to the kid a bunch of different uh, robins and a bunch of different orioles, and even say to the kid, you know, you should pay attention perhaps to the redness of the breast or to the darkness of the, the back of the bird. And after seeing lots of these examples, then the kid eventually would form some sort of model in their head of how to tell apart the orioles from the robins. So the story is pretty much the same when it comes to machine learning. So with machine learning, instead of a kid, we've got maybe some unmanned aerial vehicle and with a camera attached, and it can collect quantitative measurements of things like breast color or back darkness. And we give this machine then a lot of different examples or copies of these different birds and assign a label to each one. So plus ones for the robins and minus ones for the orioles. And the idea of machine learning is to take all of these different examples and all of these different observed features and to somehow come up with a rule that lets us identify what type of bird is what. So for example, we could say, well, this number plus or minus one is some label Y, and our predicted label is just going to be a weighted sum of the features, say the breast color and the back color. So this would be a simple linear classifier. But of course, the real world isn't nearly this nice. We don't just have robins and orioles. We've got all different kinds of birds. They're against all different kinds of backgrounds. Sometimes there's multiple birds in the pictures. Sometimes they're flying. Sometimes they're sitting. And so coming up with a generic way of taking a generic photograph and identifying whether there's a bird in it or what type of bird it is is significantly more complicated than this very simple two-dimensional example that I just showed. And so the methods that constitute the current state of the art are based right now on deep neural networks. And let me just give you a, a flavor of, of how these things work. So they're composed of building blocks, where each building block is a, a single layer neural network. So before, I said we could build a classifier by looking at a weighted sum of features. So we would assign some weight or importance to back color and some weight or importance to breast color. With a neural network, we're again computing these weighted sums. So these features are weighted and then put into this little node here. And then this node does some nonlinear transformation to that weighted sum, like compute the sign. And that produces some sort of output. And we can scale this up to large numbers of different features and large numbers of different weights. So when people talk about deep neural networks, they're basically taking this simple building block and attaching large groups of them together in a stack. 
so that you would feed your input um, images into one end and you would get an estimate of what the label was, whether there was a bird or not on the other end. And machine learning algorithms are focused on trying to learn what all of these different weights should be for every node or every little building block inside this deep neural network. So this architecture here corresponds to Google and that it was the state-of-the-art image recognition deep neural network back in 2015. So let's talk a little bit about what we know about these kinds of systems. The good news, like I've hinted at, is that they do produce the state-of-the-art results for a number of different applications, including image recognition and speech analysis. Also, uh, there's emerging work where they're being used for things like predicting disease or helping with drug discovery. So the predictions that we are able to get out of these architectures um, exceed anything that we've been able to do in the history of machine learning. And so it's a very exciting time. That said, it's not a unilaterally good story. And there's definitely some, some sobering aspects of these deep neural networks that we should all keep in mind. For instance, no one really knows on a fundamental level how these different systems work. We don't understand their failure modes, for instance. We have a very difficult time saying what kinds of inputs to these networks are going to result in some sort of catastrophic failure. And that's pretty important if you're thinking about using these deep neural networks to guide your self-driving tractor. So here's an example of these sort of failure modes that might not be intuitive that was developed by some Google researchers in 2015. So they took a little picture of a panda, and if they were to send it through that Google Lynette that I just showed you, it would correctly identify it as a panda. Then what they did is they added some noise to it. So they took this noise image and they multiplied it times 0 .007. So it's a, just a tiny amount of noise. So that when you look at the sum, it's imperceptibly different. You can't see any difference at all as a human. But if you send this image to this noisy image through that same image recognition system, it says it's a given monkey as opposed to a panda. So we get a dramatically different dis uh, um, result from the same neural network system using imperceptibly different inputs. And this is something that is very sobering if you want to know, well, when is my neural network going to break down? Because this is something that many of us perhaps would not have anticipated in advance. In addition, these neural networks are typically not interpretable. So you might be able to get a great prediction of let's say when your crop is going to reach peak harvest. But that's not necessarily going to give you insights into what are the causative factors that are driving that date and what kinds of things you can do to manage your production, to manage your, your farm, to increase your yield. So the lack of interpretability kind of limits what we can do with these models. Okay, so we've seen the good, we've seen the bad, now the ugly. Um, first of all, Trying to do computation with these really large scale models requires significant, significant amounts of computation, far beyond what you can do on a single laptop and beyond what most producers have available to them. And perhaps even more significantly, it requires tens of millions of diverse training samples. And each of those training samples needs to be annotated and labeled. So let's look at an example of why that's so critical. Um, Imagine that I wanted to train a deep neural network to distinguish between cats and dogs. So I give it some cat pictures, excuse me. I give it some cat pictures, I give it some dog pictures, and I run the standard training algorithms. I learn all the weights in my system. And then I feed it a new image and I say, okay, you tell me, is this a cat or a dog? And it comes back and it says dog. Because I have got this training set where all my dog images have a whole lot of green pixels. And so because I have this very skewed or biased set of training data, I get a very skewed or biased estimate coming out of the other end. And this is something that is very obvious to us when we look at this little toy example. A more subtle example is something that you might have read about in the news in which Ankur referred to earlier, which is that we've seen examples of so-called racial bias or gender bias in the outputs of deep neural networks. And it's not because the engineers were biased, but because they used somewhat skewed training data sets. And these are things that we can identify. 
But when you're trying to work with things like different measurements of soil across different fields, it can be very difficult for us to determine whether our training data set is diverse enough to safeguard us against these kinds of, of failures and biases. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I'm just picking on deep neural networks. A lot of the issues that I'm, I'm talking about here uh, are true across machine learning um, and kind of hint at some key fundamental challenges that, that we face as a community. So we have more powerful and more um, accurate predictive methods than ever before in machine learning. Uh, deep neural networks are one example, but there's random forest, support vector machines, and, and a host of other approaches. But for many of these methods, some of the issues that I'm hinting at uh, remain critical issues. Um, I talked about interpretability, somehow translating predictions coming out of these models into actual strategies for improving yield or managing production. Another issue is stability. How will new uh, conditions or inputs to our models sort of change the output? If we were to suddenly have a little bit of noise in our measurements because our camera was slowly dying, or if weather conditions changed in a way that was not reflected in our training set, how long can things get? And these are questions that are wide open and very poorly understood um, for, for some of these predictive models. There are two other fundamental issues that I haven't really talked about yet, but which I'm going to illustrate um, for the remainder of the talk. And they are adaptability and interactivity. So I mentioned that in order to make a lot of these big data systems work, we really do need a huge amount of data. And if we're talking about something like imagery, it can be pretty easy to collect lots of images, but it can be really hard to get a human expert to go through and label all of those images. And so having a fully fleshed out training set can be a major challenge for specialized applications. So when I talk about adaptability, I'm saying, well, you know, there are other situations where we do have huge training data sets, like the training data sets Google used to train its image recognition systems. And so one question is, can we somehow leverage the knowledge that we're getting from one learning algorithm, where we've got lots of data, and transfer that over to a new application where we've got more limited data? And what's the right way to go about that, that domain adaptation or that transfer learning? And finally, interactivity. And it's closely um, tied to this adaptability issue. Uh, if we do have a human expert who's capable of labeling images, but who is not capable of labeling tens of millions of images in a short amount of time, then how do we best leverage that limited human feedback? So let me show you one example of these kinds of ideas in action and some, some work that we've been doing to try to address them here at UW-Madison. So imagine that we have a producer and he's going through his, his orchard and he notices that there's something wrong with his apples. And you know he's a good farmer, he knows a lot of different diseases, but he sees one that he just doesn't recognize. Well, what he would do nowadays is he would actually come here to UW-Madison and talk to one of our experts at the UW Extension and try to get some help identifying it. But you could imagine that we could say, well, can we somehow leverage big data in this problem? So could he take a picture of his um, sick fruit and feed it through a Google image search and see what Google has to say? And so I actually did this. I took this image of this sick fruit and I sent it through Google's search by image engine. And this is what I get. And you can see there's a lot of worthless stuff in here. I'm getting bananas, pears, toma healthy tomatoes, papaya, corn. Um, I guess there's a lot of sick stuff too, but it doesn't really help me identify what's wrong with my specific fruit. And the issue is that when Google builds its search engine, this search by image engine, it's trying to pair up visually similar images. And it's using a notion of similarity that is based on its individual um, training set and what some set of humans thought similar meant. But that's not the measure of similarity that our producer or our farmer has in mind when he's trying to identify what's wrong with his fruit. So put another way, um, when you think about these traditional search engines, you put in a query, our picture of a sick fruit, and it comes back with a bunch of responses that it thinks are somehow visually similar. What we've been doing is trying to um, do something that's a little bit more interactive. 
where, again, we send in a query corresponding to one of these sick fruits, but then the interactive search engine would just return one response. And it would ask the human for feedback. Is this what you're looking for or not? And in this case, since it's bananas, we would say no. And in response, using that feedback, an interactive search engine would then update its model of what is or is not relevant to the, the farmer or the user and return a new image that it thinks is more likely to be relevant. Again, get feedback, return another image, again, get feedback, etc. So it's this interactive approach where with each response from the human, we're updating a model of what similar means or what's really relevant to the human user in his specific task or specific context. And so we are adapting to the context of the user and we are taking the, um, what knowledge we have about how to represent images that was learned in another context for Google's original representations of images and adapting it to this new context of trying to find out what's wrong with my fruit. So let me just say a couple of technical words about how something like this might work under the hood and how it's related to some of the ideas we talked about earlier. So the idea is that we would have a collection of different images, the whole database of images. And we can think about each image as a list of different features. So with birds, we said, well, it would be like breast color, back color. Here we could have all different kinds of features of all the different images in our database. Now, when we have a user come to use our interactive search engine, that user is going to be associated with some weight vector. And the user doesn't necessarily know this weight vector, but it's reflected in his or her preferences. And it's indicating which features of these images are more or less relevant to his or her task. And so what we're thinking is that the user's response when we give them the teeth image can be modeled as somehow a weighted combination of all of the features um, of, the fe of that teeth image. So when we give an image to a user and he views it and he gives us some feedback about whether it's relevant or not, then we compute a new estimate at every time of what this weight vector might be. And we then use that estimate to decide what next image we should be giving to the user that's hopefully going to be, again, relevant to him or her. And pictorially, we can think about it like this. All of these little yellow dots would correspond to images in our database. And after some number of rounds of doing this, I've got an estimate W hat, which is right here in this green dot. And it's not exactly the same as the best estimate that I could compute if I had an infinite amount of, of labels from my human. But nevertheless, what I can do is I can leverage ideas from math and statistics to say, well, even though my estimate W hat is known to be imperfect, somehow my truth is somewhere in a confidence set that's centered around this estimate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the next image to show to my user by choosing one that's somehow maximally aligned with the best possible weight vector in this whole confidence set. And this turns out to have a huge impact in practice. Now, I don't really know a whole lot about fruit diseases, but I know a lot of people who know a lot about shoes. So we tested this on the Zappos data set. Uh, they had 50,000 images of different kinds of shoes. And the first thing we did is we extracted some features of these shoes. And for this, we leveraged things like Google's Lynette to get a good representation of what information is contained in the shoes. Now, if we were to take that representation from Google Lynette and just say, tell me everything that's similar to this in initial target image. What are the 10 most, or what is this, eight? What are the eight most similar images to this initial query? I would get this collection here. And what we see is that there are some red boots, but there are also a lot of other things that are nothing like red boots. In contrast, if we use this interactive method that I just described, then we get the same first response from our search engine. But based on our feedback that, yeah, we like this a lot, we update our model, and we get a sequence of images from this interactive search engine, almost all of which are relevant to our specific goal of finding red boots. Uh, here's a more numerical representation of this. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different adaptive algorithms, and what I just want you to focus on is green versus not green. Green here corresponds to how many good images our producer is, is looking at 
if we just look at nearest neighbors and we don't do any adaptation and we don't take any kind of human feedback. And all the other colors correspond to what we can achieve and essentially how happy our end user is with the experience um, if we do do this kind of interactive search mechanism. And so you can see that there are significant potentials for gain. There is a significant potential for gains. Okay, so to conclude, I would say that there really is a ton of potential for data science in agriculture. We're developing more and more powerful methods on a regular basis. But as Mark and Anker both suggested earlier this morning, we can't treat these methods as simple black boxes for us to plug new agricultural data sets into. And if we do that, we really put our, ourselves at risk. I think in the best case, we'll get results that aren't especially useful. And in the worst case, we'll get very misleading or biased results. And so I think there's a critical role for collaborations between people from the data science and the agricultural communities. Um, and to summarize some of the major open data science questions that I think are particularly relevant to these interactions between data science and, and um, agriculture, we have to deal with interpretability and coming up with models that people can actually use to improve their um, management strategies moving forward. Um, stable methods where we can actually predict when a small amount of noise or small variations in our training data training data sets and how they're going to impact the results of our learning algorithms. And finally, adaptability, so translating knowledge gained in one context to a totally different context, and interactivity, trying to leverage limited amounts of human feedback. So with that, I just want to um, thank you all for listening and also thank uh, Brian Locke, Rob Nowak, and Irvashi Oswald, who all provided a lot of valuable feedback as I was preparing the slides. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Let's take just one question. Thank you. Uh, in your interactive search strategy, how much of the sort of the next suggestion is based on this is my best guess for what you want, and how much of it is this will cut the remaining space in half? Like your answer will cut yes or no. So it's, it's not the latter. So when you think about trying to cut the remaining space in half, you would do that if you're trying to kind of learn this dividing line as quickly as possible. And to do that, you want to get both good and bad samples on either side of that dividing line. In this application, we don't want our producer to spend half his time looking at things that are irrelevant to his diseased fruit. So the goal is really a little bit different. And so we really are not honing in on that dividing line as opposed to just trying to find useful stuff as often as possible. Yeah, great question. Right. Thank right. you again. Thank you.